Okay, so let's begin. So first, you need to understand is that like all physical systems, they're described by some sort of equation of motion. For a string, motion of a string, whether it's clamped or not clamped, whether they're standing waves or traveling waves, the motion of a string is described by the following equation of motion. Um, again, don't be alarmed if this is uncomfortable. What you should be doing is you should be asking questions, okay? If something is confusing, you should turn that confusion into a question. That's the hardest part, is to turning your general, uh, I'm confused, into a specific question. Okay, that's, that's, that's what you should be focusing on. And that's where the individual instruction comes in. Okay, so attending office hours, it's the opposite of, um, it's, the opposite, it's the opposite of a shameful thing. It's the right thing to do, okay? In any case, what is V? V is the square root of force of tension divided by the density that we discussed. You might say, well, what is this? This is something weird. I've never seen this. Actually, you have. This is basically acceleration. And this is uh, force per mass, basically. So what this says, the physical meaning of this is that the curvature of a string determines the restoring force, right? So if you have a piece of string, Uh, this end experiences uh, one force of tension, and this end experiences another force of tension. And what matters is the second derivative of, of the string, basically the curvature. So the net, the net restoring force in the y direction is proportional to the curvature. So that means if, if you have a piece of string that's straight, okay, uh, actually, there's no net force in the y direction. Um, I'm not going to derive this. I'm just stating this to you. But if you're interested in, like, where does this come from? Like, where, where does this come from? How do you turn f equals ma into this weird-looking equation? This is actually described in your introductory uh, physics book by Randy Knight. I believe it's discussed in chapter... Chapter 16, I think, 16, no, chapter 16 or 17, it's one of the advanced topics. In any case, this is the equation of motion, okay? Uh, any uh, motion of any string in tension uh, at sufficiently small displacements uh, will be described by this equation. But remember, the equation is not enough, okay? So there are also boundary conditions. Okay, for a doubly uh, clamped, maybe not clamped, doubly pinned string, i.e. attached at both ends, Well, so y is the vertical displacement, right? So this is y, right? Um, 
what are the boundary conditions? What would you say? How would you mathematize the fact that the ends can't move? Up, down. Well, you would say that the boundary condition, the mathematical way of representing that is that the displacement, the vertical displacement of the left end equals zero and the vertical displacement at the right end is also zero. So no matter what happens in between, the vertical displacement of the ends must be zero. Okay, let me uh, redraw this a little bit clearer. Okay, and again, if I wasn't clear, I want to uh, be clear that X is the horizontal coordinate and Y is the displacement of a string, right? So at different points of X, there's a different displacement. Y of X is a vertical displacement at coordinate Okay. Uh, also, there's no gravity, no gravity and no friction. If there was gravity, equation of motion has to be modified. If there was friction, equation of motion also has to be modified further. There would be additional terms. So that is the setup. Well, why do we write down equations? Usually it's because we want their solutions. And we're interested in a modal solution. Again, what is a mode? Mode is a pattern of oscillation where each point on the string experiences the same temporal dynamics, basically. Okay, we're seeking special solutions, solutions that represent the pattern of oscillation, which all parts of the system undergo the same dynamics with identical frequency and a fixed phase relation. Maybe I should uh, uh, modify what I said here is, uh, it's a pattern of vibration, which every point on the object oscillates uh, at the same frequency with a fixed phase relation. That's a little bit more general. Uh, so basically it means the same, same dynamics at every point. So if you think about it, that means that a modal solution as a function of space and time will be separated into some kind of a time component and some kind of an X component, okay? So again, we're looking for solutions in which all parts of the system undergo the same dynamics uh, with identical frequency and a fixed phase relation, or you can think of the same phase. That means as a function of time, what this point on the string is doing is the same as what this point on the string is doing. They might have different amplitudes that are determined by their location, but the temporal dynamics is the same. The same temporal, same temporal dynamics at all the points. And that is why I separated the temporal part of the solution separately. Okay, so we seek, these are called, uh, this is called, uh, this form of solution is called 
for obvious reasons, variable separable. In general, like I said, these are very special solutions, but we can construct a general solution that describes general pattern of oscillation under all conditions using these special, very, very special solutions. Okay, so variable separable solutions are very special solutions, but they're building blocks out of which we can build up any solution. Okay, so the next, the rest is just uh, sort of just grinding through the math and finding solutions. You see that the setup is very important. So plug, plug into uh, right, equation of motion. So this is called equation of motion. E O M. Okay, uh, plug into the Okay, so let's do that. Now you will tell me what to do. You will tell me what to write. So let's see. On the left hand side, I have the second time derivative. Okay, let's do that. So it's a partial derivative, which means it will only operate on the So this is y, capital Y, it's not psi. Uh, okay, and on the left hand side, I have v squared, which is a constant. It's just square root of tension, tension force over the density. You might say, oh, but doesn't the tension force change uh, as the string is deflected? That's a, that's a very small effect. So imagine the string is under a lot of tension to begin with. So yes, local tension does change a little bit, but we're neglecting that effect. At larger amplitudes, the fact that tension depends on the deflection of the string itself does become more important and um, for larger amplitudes, this equation doesn't hold true anymore. There will be additional corrections, additional terms. Okay, um, uh, so let's, ooh, well, let's continue on the left hand side, uh, on the right hand side, I have second spatial derivative of tau of t times y of x. Now tell me what to do next. What would you do? Okay, so this is a function of time, and this is a function of space, okay? Now, time derivative doesn't operate on space, so it just pops out of the, the derivative, and so you have y of x times the, it becomes a, a total derivative, tau dt squared, equals v squared, and now here the tau pops out because this operates only on, on the, uh, you see this operates only on x and this operates only on, on time. And so you get, it's a, a second derivative, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a total derivative, right? Because tau is only a function of time and y is only a function of space, okay? And this is, you know, let's get out of this habit. This is too much to write. I'm not going to write the fact that it's a function of time and function of space. Okay, good. So, so what do we do now? Uh, let's divide everything. Divide everything by the product of y times tau. You might say, oh, why? What if it's zero? Well, just, just relax, just, just bear with me. So what you get then is you get y over y tau times d squared tau dt squared equals v squared tau over y tau d squared y dx squared. So it should be squared. And you can see that these things cancel And then what we have 
equals v squared. Okay. Now, here's a key tender point in the discussion. By the way, this is not a derivation. I'm not deriving, I'm solving a problem. You might say, oh, you're just trying to prove to us that these are sine waves. Well, we don't care, we believe you. Well, obviously, we're going to use the same procedure when solving quantum mechanics problems, right? So we're learning the procedure, okay? We're not trying to prove anything. We're learning how to solve uh, problems, right? We're, we're learning a method. You're learning a method, basically. Just like when you take mechanics, and you learn these silly things about you know how to decompose vectors, how black slide down inclined planes and all that nonsense. Well, why do you do that? Is because is it because black sliding down in inclined plane planes is so so important? No, because you're learning a method. So we're learning a method here. Okay, so here's the key. This is a function of time only. For example, if tau as a function of t is sine of omega t. Well, okay, so then this will be in the numerator uh, is just a function of time. And if this is, I don't know, e to the x squared something something, well, this is only a function of space. You see the right-hand side is only a function of space, okay? So how can a function of time be equal to a function of space? They're, it's like, right, one is apples, the other is oranges. So have we done anything, something wrong? If you think about it, you will realize the only way that a function of time can be equal to a function of space is if both functions are simply constants. The only way a function of time can be equal to a function of space is if both are a constant function. So tau versus t is a constant of value c and y versus x is a constant of the same value c. Okay. 